Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome back for another week of live radio right here with me, your host, Kev Baker. And of course, I'm coming to you live on the Truth Frequency Radio Network, www.tfrlive.com. And it's as if I've fired up the time machine today because we are here at the earlier time in the UK of 9pm until 11pm. So it's an early finish for me tonight. What am I going to do with all that extra time on my hands? And for anyone that's wondering, well, why has that happened? That's because our American brothers, brothers and sisters, they moved their clocks forward before the UK. They've done that at the weekend so with us being a US network, something I'm very, very proud to be broadcasting on, we stick to the US timing. So I thank everyone who has made it here for the earlier time tonight. And no doubt as the week goes on, we'll see more and more people catching on to this earlier time slot. And what a week we've got planned here on the show. Got a brilliant guest coming up tonight. Can't even call him a guest anymore. Definitely a good friend. And then tomorrow, another friend coming on to the show. She comes on once a month now, and her name is Jojo Seabacker. And I know a lot of you out there love to listen to the positive vibes of Jojo. And then on Wednesday night, get this, folks. This is becoming a regular occurrence here. Can't work enough with this guy. Ryan Gable is going to be coming back onto the show. We'll be talking about him in just a moment with today's guest. And then to round out the week, it's a full house here. We have got Enda Coin coming onto the show. Now, Enda's very nervous. He isn't used to doing radio. He was on with Bill Bean just the other night. And some of the stories that he's going to share with us about his childhood, about what's led him to where he is today, it's going to be enough to make your hair curl. So Thursday night, dim the lights. It's going to be one of those creepy paranormal shows. But back to tonight, because we have got a doozy lined up, because my good friend is here and he's live with us tonight. And he is the man behind the octopus of global control. And of course, for anyone who hasn't heard this dude, I'm talking about the one and only Charlie Robinson. And if you haven't heard Charlie before, you're in for a rare treat. Because Charlie <laughs> is the author of The Octopus of Global Control, a controversial and hilarious book that features the opinions of over 500 experts that expose and explain the century-long plan for world domination by the global elite. Now, Charlie is somebody like myself who takes a rather sarcastic and at times ironic look at what is unfolding around us and how all of that actually factors into this over-a-century-long plan to form a new world order. So like many people, Charlie went through his awakening and he went through it after reading the book by John Perkin called Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Now, this was really relevant to the field that Charlie was working in at the time because he was working in Las Vegas real estate at the time of the collapse. And with all of that said, and the fact that he likes to keep on top of all the same stories that I'm looking at from day to day, that's why tonight is going to be rather special. So, Charlie, welcome back to the show, my good friend. Well, thanks for having me. I will start um, with a quote from my book. Only the government would believe that you could cut a foot off the top of a blanket, sew it to the bottom, and have a longer blanket. <laughs> that is in honor of the daylight savings, what's, whatever it is you want to call it, that we participate in every year. To say it is ridiculous is an understatement to... It's an insult to ridiculous things. But here we go, changing the clocks an hour forward and an hour back to control time, I guess. I don't know. I have Doesn't no idea. Sense. It's like Doctor Who has taken over in the UK and things. And I know they were talking about actually scrapping this kind of thing. But I think the problem would be up here in Scotland, I think in the middle of winter, we would be going to school when it's pitch black because of our mm -hmm. northern location. I've got no idea what the heck British summertime, Greenwich Mean Time... It's just time. Just leave it alone. Let us do our thing, dude, because this just confuses people. It, it was sold to the American people as as a way to conserve energy. How they calculated this, I will never understand. Wait a minute. But it so just there's still, still 20, there's still, there's still 24 in, in hours in a day. There's 24 right. hours in a day, whether you chop one off or add one on. And yeah, like you say, how's that meant to save anything? <laughs> It, it it just epitomizes the hypocrisy of American government. 
that they would focus. You so they'll focus on things like daylight savings time because that's really important, and yet they'll completely ignore calls for like you know stopping dropping bombs on foreign countries. So it's just a distraction. Everyone gets very excited about it here, though. They're like, "Oh, we're gonna spring forward. We lose an hour. Oh, damn it, we lose an hour. How dare we lose an hour? Lose an hour of." Did you get in a DeLorean and go back <laughs> in time? How are you losing an hour? My flux still cap- hours. I'm telling you, dude, my flux capacitor is on the blink right now. It truly uh, is. You know, the you. DeLorean's well, parked in the drive. I can't afford to tax <laughs> it over here in the UK anymore. The time tax is ridiculous. It truly is. They'll, but Charlie, they always get you with the time tax. Oh, UK, they tax us for everything over here, dude. You sent me a long list of things to get into today. <laughs> and what amused me more was the fact that it's the kind of things I've been looking at anyway. And I noticed yeah. just yesterday I reshared a video that you had put out. And it was Jimmy Dore. And anyone who hasn't checked yeah. out the Jimmy Dore show, I love that dude. He is absolutely brilliant. But he was talking about something that is very important to anyone in the alternative media, anyone seeking truth, anyone looking to blow the whistle on any corruption, Chelsea Manning. Yeah. So what's happened there, Charlie? Well, what happened with Chelsea Manning is that we saw what it looks like when somebody with principles and conviction stands up and does the right thing and tells the government where they can go. Um, Chelsea Manning was called in to testify before a grand jury. Now, a grand jury is a secretive um, meeting. It's behind closed doors. And... Chelsea Manning says, I'm not testifying there. It, even if you go in. So the thing about grand juries is what a lot of times they use them to create the perception that somebody is a snitch. That person can go into a meeting behind closed doors in the grand jury and say absolutely nothing and or tell them nothing, you know, just say not not rat out anybody, but just the mere mention of that around somebody's name is enough to start to put cracks in their united front. If there's a group of people that have agreed they're not going to talk to the government, they don't want, you know, whether they've done anything wrong or not is, is almost irrelevant. But if they've made the decision that they're not talking, they're not talking. If somebody goes in behind the, the closed doors in a grand jury meeting, then everyone else that isn't in that meeting is left to assume what has been said. And what they will assume is that that person is giving it up, giving up the goods and and cutting a deal or something like that. Even if it's not happening, the perception of that is enough to screw up uh, the solidarity between defendants. So what they were trying to do with the grand jury is have Chelsea Manning come in there and talk to them. Whether she says anything or not would become irrelevant because just the fact that that meeting was happening and she was participating in it would be enough to um, send shockwaves through WikiLeaks, you know, give the potential that this is a person, hey, listen, people could understand if Chelsea Manning went in there and, and, and told them something, even if it was very little, but something, so that she wouldn't go back to prison. But she walked in there with middle fingers raised, I'm assuming, I just made that up, but I'm assuming that she said, I'm not saying anything to anybody. And so they held her in contempt and put her in jail. Wow. Just... <laughs> that is that is that is called a commitment to the cause. That is somebody that has morals and principles. And I am sure that doing that in Washington has thrown them for a loop because nobody has principles and morals in Washington, not many people at least. And so that act is probably as alien to them as anything they've ever seen. But to the alternative media, to the truth community, to the people that care about news facts, care about WikiLeaks, care about uh, exposing government corruption, it's the most patriotic and heroic thing we've seen in quite some time. And and I don't think that, and, and of course, as you would expect here in the United States, there's a virtual media blackout of it. There was really no discussion of it. They don't want to make her out to be a, a, a hero or a martyr or anything like that. So they just pretend like it doesn't happen right on schedule. And of course, Chelsea Manning shot to prominence for the leaks to WikiLeaks. And without the information about war crimes, this is the important thing. It was war crimes that Manning yeah. brought forth. We've seen that video of the gunship 
attacking the reporters and the innocent people. Without Chelsea Manning, we would never, ever have learned any of that. And, you know, people in the government today, Charlie, who may have their hands on information or they know of corruption, you know, they must look at the treatment of somebody like Chelsea Manning, Edward Snowden, and must think, well, what is the point? What's the point in blowing any whistle here? Because it's going to be the end of my life as I know it. And that's exactly why they do it. That's why they try to put these people under the, bury them under the prison, in a secret prison where they can't talk to anyone, where their lives are destroyed. They want to make an example out of anybody that's thinking of doing this in the future. This is what tyrannical regimes do. And, uh, you know, the United States... Um, uses that term, tyrannical regimes, when talking about other countries in the in the Middle East. They talk, they use it when they talk about Syria, now in the now it's Venezuela, definitely Iran. They used it about Iraq before. Um, the United States is a tyrannical regime. Yeah. The first they thing are. any tyrannical regime does is shut down and shut up any opposition, anyone speaking out against it. I think we're seeing that pretty much, not only just with the US government, but it's the same over here, Charlie. Oh, you know, yeah. you could course. even go to Australia. We were talking about David Icke yeah. recently. Yeah. That's a tyrannical move, banning somebody from coming and sharing ideas, you know? Yeah, yeah. That, it shows a level of insecurity on their part because they know that there are secrets that can be exposed. And so, and they can't win the debate because there's no debate. So in, in, in order to make sure that the debate never happens, they silence it. They make sure that the people aren't allowed to talk. And that so and thus proving the point of the um, whistleblower entirely by coming out and saying, you know, I, I want to I'm telling you about all this. And then they put me in a cage for years and years. You've just validated, you know, the government has just validated the whistleblower's point, which is I am exposing a tyrannical regime because if they had nothing to hide, then their response wouldn't be so, um, you know, so authoritarian. This is exactly but, uh, what Ike said. That's what in, yeah, that's what Ike said in response to his banning. You know, they're only proving that everything he says about them is true. Now, right. in the case of Manning, then, has she been sent back to jail? Is this, yes. like, how long for? Do we know? Um, the... the she, the grand jury convenes for up to 18 months, and then there can be a six-month extension on top of that. And then at that point, it would go to, then they would just start pulling out all the dirty tricks they have. So in theory, it's 18 months plus the potential for an extension of six months, but in reality, it's indefinite because they, there will always be some judge that will sign off on some nonsense clause that they'll throw in at the last minute, at, you know, at, at the last day of the 23rd month. And uh, so I would expect that I would expect this to be an indefinite, indefinite uh, detention. No. And, and she was taken into custody Friday when she appeared in, at, at, in court, uh, said she would not speak, was charged with contempt and was taken into custody immediately and interviewed before she went in, knowing damn well that that was going to happen. So. That I was going to say that takes balls, but probably not. Oh, the, yeah. probably not the right terminology to use in this case. And I well, wonder. Well, you know, in I this wonder, case, I think I'm safe to say that Chelsea Manning has bigger balls than most guys. Yep, absolutely. Now, we've seen Jimmy Dore speaking out about this. Me and you are talking about it, and I'm a bit of an alternative media junkie, but I haven't heard too many other people talking about this. That's it's, it's, that's worrying. It's creeping dude. in there. It's not. It's not as it's not, I'll tell you what, it's not as big of an out, outrage as I would have uh, hoped it would be. But it is, um, there, are, there are a lot, there are, you know, who is really speaking out about it the most are the former whistleblowers, um, Bill Benny, Daniel Ellsberg, Edward Snowden, people like that are definitely coming out, coming to the, uh, you know, to the aid, Glenn Greenwald as well, of course. Um, so there, there are people that are, that have some sort of connection to the to the whistleblowing community that have been very vocal about it, but um, mainstream media, almost nothing. Uh, alternative media, a, a better, but not not to the extent. Um, th I mean, this should be fr front page headline. I say it should be, but I mean, I, I'm not. Ex I wasn't expecting it to be because I, we understand how controlled the corporate media is. But in reality, I mean, if it was, if if this was a level playing field with a with a media doing its actual job, it would be the lead story. Because what they don't understand, uh, either they don't, 
either they choose not to understand it or they're so stupid that they don't understand it is that this impacts them. They just don't know it yet. They haven't figured it out yet. They think of Chelsea Manning as this person over there that's some spy or some, you know, some anti-American. What, what it's a wonder they haven't accused her. Freedom. It's a wonder they haven't accused her of having Kremlin ties. I mean, everyone's got Kremlin oh, ties these days, right? It's not over yet. It well, still could happen. <laughs> and I wonder, you know, because obviously at the time when Manning was originally jailed, a lot of talk about it in the alternative media, and then... He decided to have the sex change or transgender. Now, I wonder if people's prejudices uh, have kind of got in the way here. And that's why in alternative media, more than mainstream media, I wouldn't expect to see it there. But at the time, it was almost as if a lot of people kind of forgot about Manning when all that happened. And now that she's back in the news again, I wonder if people are maybe just even subconsciously maybe hesitant to touch it because something in their own mind, something changed with Chelsea becoming Chelsea. It's possible. In the alternative media, I haven't seen that. I have seen a very respectful, I think because they respect Bradley Manning, Chelsea Manning, whoever the, they they respect the person, yeah. uh, regardless of the gender. And you and I have been, have goofed on the gender stuff b before, but we've always been very upfront about saying that for those that it is a legitimate issue, it's got to be an incredibly terrifying experience and confusing and, 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 you know, just socially unusual. So I have a lot of empathy for people that are going through that. I, the, the response in the alternative media to the name change from, from Bradley to Chelsea, uh, as far as I could see has been very respectful with everybody, you know, sort of making that, that switch mainstream media. I don't expect anything from them. They weren't respectful when when it was Bradley Manning exposing this. I don't know why they would. Um, I don't know why they would suddenly get on board when it's Chelsea. Although they are heavily pushing an agenda of you know everybody's you know there's 50 different genders, you know. But but this is just one of those topics that they have been instructed to not comment on, which is idiotic because it's going to impact them. This is you know this is the the first they came for Chelsea Manning. And then they came for the alternative media, and then they came for you, the corporate media. But they're so stupid, and so arrogant, and so unaware of the culture change that they think that um, they don't they don't see themselves as being even connected to this in any way. When what WikiLeaks has done is take the media, and, and, and sh WikiLeaks is showing corporate media how to do their job, and I don't think they appreciate it. Because no. they've given up on trying to do their to do their actual job to be the the fourth pillar, you know, to to check the the those in power. They're in bed with those in power. They're not checking anybody. They work. They're not even they, checking their own stories. They work for those in power now. It's they never been so them. obvious. But I was going to ask you. You've kind of answered it, really. WikiLeaks. There's a bit of controversy about whether they're good or bad. I like them. You know, they don't mm -hmm. seem to take sides. They publish things about Democrats, Republicans. It doesn't matter who you are. If they've got something on you, they'll publish it. But it's almost as if, especially in the conspiracy sphere where we find ourselves, people are just so paranoid that they can't trust anything. And that's why they kind of yeah. question even organizations like WikiLeaks, who for me have been absolutely a breath of fresh air, but why do you think people are maybe a bit hesitant about Assange and WikiLeaks? Well, because they've been, they've had, they've watched infiltration happen at every level. Anything that's organic and real and meaningful, uh, whether it's Occupy Wall Street, uh, the WTO uh, uh, rallies in Seattle back in 99, or, or the Yellow Vest, at some point, one of these, these organic uprisings gets co-opted. Uh, the agent pr provocateurs come in, start throwing Molotov cocktails, beating people up, shooting at the police, and then that gives them the right to come in and tear the whole thing down. I think people that in the alternative media or the truth community or whatever you want, however you want to define it, see WikiLeaks as being one of these great organizations that does what they say they're going to do. They have a record, 100% re record of not being, uh, not losing a case in court. They bring the truth, but we're all so 
beat down over the years and so uh, aware of how these things change and how the government will see something like this, decide they need to destroy it and then get find a way to get in and do it. So WikiLeaks, everyone's just waiting. They're just waiting for them to get turned, uh, waiting for them to get corrupted. I hope it doesn't happen, but I understand why people are suspicious of, of that because it, that that's the that's the pattern because they're so on point and so accurate with their information and their reporting and so dangerous and damaging to the control system that if you are one of those psychopaths in control, they would be at the top of your list. Yeah. And I mean, and they'll spend time and money infiltrating hippie groups. You damn well better be uh, aware that they're going to go after WikiLeaks. And if they can't take Julian Assange down and hang him, which they would love to do, uh, they'll do this next best thing, which is compromise his operation. So I would, I don't, I don't fault people for being suspicious about WikiLeaks moving forward, uh, as long as they acknowledge that that there had been. And might might still be, but there had been a time when they were pure. Their intentions were honest, and they were really out there exposing people. But it's only a matter of time. And the only reason they really stand out as this shining light is because of the mainstream media. Because in reality, right. they're only doing the job that the mainstream media should always have been doing anyway. Exactly. They should have been the ones holding these people to account. They should have been the ones that were giving whistleblowers the safety to come forward to share their stories without fear of reprisals. But that that's all gone, and that's why something like WikiLeaks, it should be the, the kind of standard that we all kind of live up to, Charlie. But in this day For and sure. age, it's gone. No, the, the mainstream media is like, is like a classroom with kids that are all the C students. And WikiLeaks is that one kid sitting in the front row getting an A on every test. And everyone else is looking at him saying, hey, man, you're making us look bad. Stop doing what you're doing. You're screwing with our whole routine that we've got here. And I don't think they appreciate that. But um, but you're right. That if Instead of targeting that one person and saying, hey, come de back down to C student status with the rest of us, they should be looking at each other going, well, we should raise our game. We should we should work harder to, um, to, to be better at our jobs. But they don't see it like that because they're paid to be bad at their jobs. Yep. They're, we only think they're bad at their jobs, but from their boss's point of view, they're brilliant at their jobs. Because we just assume that their job is to tell the truth. Exactly. When it's not. <laughs> yep, exactly. It's the same as when people say to me, that Theresa May, she's doing such an awful job, Kev. I, I can't believe she's so inept. And I think, well, from the people's point of view, if she was yeah. meant to represent us, yes, but you have to flip it around. She does not work for us. She works for the EU, and every spanner she puts in Brexit, they're giving her a big clap on the back. She, oh, she's getting a yeah. Christmas bonus this year. She's done a great job as far as the people, her real bosses are concerned, but her real bosses are not you and and, 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 that's why and I don't the vote. people. That's why I don't vote. It's just, uh, it just encourages them. It really does just right. encourage them. <laughs> and if, I tell you, if voting was ever going to make a difference, Charlie, they'd have banned it years ago. And I think Mark Twain was the one who came out with that originally, but... Um, Ne Maybe. Never a truer word. Now, before no, we go to the break, I was saying there about the mainstream media, that they've gone to sleep at the wheel. In fact, they haven't. They're doing what they're told to do. And the alternative media, myself, other people, you know, Ryan Gable, who you were speaking with the other day, yeah. I'm hoping that over the months and years to come, it might be a bit pie in the sky, but I really do want us all, you know, everyone in the alternative media to be that place where people can come to as opposed to go to that mainstream brainwashing that you get on the TV. And I'm encouraged when you see people like Ryan. I think we're both very encouraged by him. He, he's got a big oh, future yeah. in this. But you do lots of shows in alternative media. What do you make of the scene right now? Do you think it has got that potential, or what do you think? I think there are some people in the alternative media that have got it right, that have a ton of integrity, and are on the side of truth. And I think there are some that are doing it for the clicks and trying to make a living at it, which is tough to do. Um, look, I admit, I will get some things wrong. I, I freely acknowledge that if you talk about the sorts of topics that we cover and speculate on some of these things, you're going to get them wrong. And I acknowledge, I don't like it, but of course I acknowledge that. If I got it wrong, I'll, I'll say I got it wrong. But I'll tell you what I won't ever do is I won't ever intentionally get it wrong. I won't come out and, comp and be compromised and say, say I'd, I'd walk away and go back to my 
regular day job than do that. I would rather do anything else than sell out. I can't understand how people do it, but you know, we just I mean, have to navigate that minefield. No, you're right. And I mean, I'm pushing for my 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. I Woo! want to get it this year and I could easily get it in a month if I was to start selling my soul and reading out and decoding Q posts. If I was to go with some of the trending topics on YouTube that are absolute bunkum, but I refuse to do it. We'll come back on the other side and pick this up with Charlie Robinson. This is the Camp Baker Show. Charlie Robinson, the man behind the octopus of global control, is here with us today, and we're getting into all of the good stuff. And if you want to check out the book, I urge you to do so. You can get that over at Amazon. You can also check out the website, The Octopus of Global Control. So, Charlie, how's the book going? Sales going well, I hope? Yeah, it's been good. It's, uh, it's, it's been out for a year and a half now. Well, I find the it priceless. Been good. I find it priceless because there's that many different kind of chapters about different topics that for somebody in my role as a host, I can go to that, thumb through and find quotes from people that are relevant to all the stuff we're talking about today. That's why I think it should be an essential piece of reading for everybody out there. I know David Icke, he's got his copy now as well. I'm still waiting for yeah. Ike to get back to me, dude. I, I, I don't know what I've done to annoy Mr. Ike, but hopefully we'll get him on here sometime <laughs> very soon. Now then, we were I hope so. Oh, absolutely. I think it's the show that the whole of the UK wants to happen, or maybe it's mm. just me that wants the whole of the UK to hear it. One of the two. I don't know. But back to what we were talking about before the break, and we were discussing Bradley stroke Chelsea Manning and the fact that she is now back in jail. Now, you rightly said that we tackle the transgender issue, sometimes tongue-in-cheek. We like to have a bit of a banter about it. But we always are very respectful to those who are transgender. We more concentrate on the agenda side of things, and there is a dark yeah. agenda to this. And that was um, highlighted just the other day over here in the UK, a story that I sent to you, and one that I've seen doing the rounds on Facebook, and many, many people were claiming was fake news. Now, the story in question comes from the Daily Mail, and the headline reads, A mother 38 is arrested in front of her children and locked up in a cell for seven hours. So what's the crime? Did the mother assault somebody? Was there some violent attack involved, you know, ripped away in front of her children? No, what this woman had done was she had misgendered somebody on Twitter. She had called a transgender woman a man. Now, this resulted in the police getting involved, three police officers going round, ripping her out of her house, jailing her. And for me, Charlie, this is a very, very dangerous turn in these affairs because talk about thought crime you know the, the thought police this is bad news dude how many police are there working out there how many crimes do they have to investigate or deal with how many idiots do they have to work with on a daily basis and and sift through clearly there are bigger problems to focus on than whether somebody on twitter called somebody else a man when they're actually a woman, especially if they're trying to be a man when they're actually a woman. I don't understand how this is a crime. It might be rude. It might be an insult. It might be offensive or, you know, I don't even know that it's any of those things, but it could be. But a crime? Give me a break. This isn't, this goes back to the conversation that Tim Poole had on Joe Rogan's show last week with Jack Dorsey. And he laid into them about this exact same thing, about people getting deplatformed for saying, yeah, but you're a man. When somebody is a man that was transitioning to be a woman and the response was, yeah, yeah, I hear all that, but you're a man because the person was born biologically a man. And that got them banned. Not that got them kicked off Twitter forever for that. I mean, we have gone into bizarro world. This is, this is, we don't have anything else to focus on besides this. We don't have any, we've cleaned up all the problems with the world and now we're, we're left to just take care of these few minor things. I mean, this is idiotic, but it's not accidental. It is, it is designed like many things in our modern culture 
to keep us distracted with things that don't matter at the expense of things that actually do matter. So while we're dealing with this or we're having, you know, classes where we have to sit all the kids down and explain to them all this, this is time that could be spent doing probably anything else would be more helpful than this. But but they've they've turned this into like it's a like it's an epidemic, like as if it's almost as if you, if you stepped out the door, you're going to be tripping over trannies everywhere. Right. If somebody right. arrived here from Mars and looked at the media before they got here to get a little taste, yeah. they would think, holy heck, we're, we're a planet of transgender people. There must only be a minority that are like not transgender. Right. It, or or you would think that it's contagious <laughs> and, and that I'm going to get it, you know, tomorrow. Better get my tranny vaccine. Uh, well, I mean, uh, it, 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 marrying those two things together will definitely get you kicked off Twitter. But that's a story we'll get to in a minute. Oh, absolutely. But, this is, but you would if you just went by the you know, Bill Hicks has this has this quote. And I was talking to Ryan Gable about this yesterday when I did a show how he how Bill Hicks would say, you oh, you know, you turn on the news and it's like death, murder, destruction, rape, mayhem, pillaging, all that. He opens his door, opens his window, looks outside. Crickets. Nothing. I don't see any of this. That's how I feel. Yeah. I go. I grew up in Palm Springs, California. Palm Springs is a very well-known gay community. It's about a third of the population is gay, and then the population's close to fifty thousand people. Um, it, it, it's a it's a really sunny place. It's a great place, and part of what makes Palm Springs fantastic is the gay community because they bring so much fun and style and vibrance and all that stuff. So I grew up in this world where you see gay people all the time. But even then, it wasn't as if there were transsexuals everywhere. And if there would have been if the, if if there was one town where that could have happened, it would have been Palm Springs. Yeah. Palm Springs, San Francisco and Laguna Beach in California. Those are the those are big uh, populations of the, for the gay community. But I didn't see that. And even when I did, every now and then, you would see someone, you would go, whoa, that doesn't look normal. But nobody, you know, people weren't out there, like, chasing the person out of the grocery store or anything like that. But these days, you watch the news, you would think, as you said, that it was an epidemic, that it was, yep. it was literally everywhere. And if your kids aren't aware of it, if you insult one of these transsexuals and call a man a woman when you should have called you know, the other way around, it's as if they that they'll eat you or something. You know what I mean? It, it, it's, it's crazy. This re, the response to this is manufactured. Yeah. It's the best way I can describe it. It's just a non-issue that is manufactured. And I don't want, I don't know how deep down this rabbit hole you want to go. Is this part of the breaking up the family agenda? I think so. Is this part I... of a transhumanism of, a, a, a thing where they're trying to get you off of this male-female paradigm and into something like, whoa, there's gender fluidity. It could be, you could be anything. You could be a computer. I don't have a problem if someone is like, I feel like I'm a man, but I was born in a woman's body. I want to transition. That's none of my business. That's their deal. Good for them. I hope everything goes well. I hope they find the peace and love and under acceptance that they're seeking. I hope their life turns out great. All, all that. I don't have a problem with that. That's their deal. I, I think it's a little ridiculous when you're like, I want to be referred to as a non-binary alien. <laughs> then, then you're being a moron. You I, know, mean, then, I, then, I want to be Spider-Man. I want matter. to be Spider-Man at school, dude. You know, when I was like I five or six and, you know, I, I don't think I was ever going to get offered an operation to give me webs in my hands or anything like that. Wow. And I'm sure if you went to a doctor and said to the doctor, you know, I, I really do believe I'm Superman. Or Spider-Man, I can crawl buildings or I can fly off them. You know, you're going to get sent for mental assessment. You truly <laughs> no. are, right? But if you go in there and say that other thing, they're going to throw drugs at you, operations at you, and give you a get-out-of-jail card. There's definitely an agenda here. And I like the fact you bring up the breaking up of the family because in your book as well, you'll have seen over the years, that is something that they've utterly tried to do. You could look at yeah. feminism as well, you know, getting women out to work, which is a good thing. I've not been I'm some misogynist here. However, yeah, it did go a long way to breaking up that family unit. And, of course, when the family unit is disrupted, then the government can step in with more control and people become dependent on them. 
You can also and the Rockefeller, the Rockefeller Foundation freely admits that they were behind that. They financed the uh, the women's uh, movement in order to break up the family, to create, to put women in the workforce, break up the family so that the kids could be um, left alone with the teachers in the schools to be indoctrinated. They 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 are on the record admitting that they they had an involvement in that. I put that in the book. Yeah. Absolutely, and it can tie into population control as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, but going back to the story, just just to tell people you know a couple of sentences here what happened you know we're talking about a mother was arrested in front of her children like i was saying locked mm -hmm. up for several hours after referring to her transgender woman as a man online three officers detained kate scotto at her home before quizzing her at a police station about an argument with an activist on twitter over so-called dead naming now i've never heard of this term before dead naming says a 38-year-old from Hitchin, Hertfordshire. Get this. She had her photograph taken, her DNA, and her fingerprints now all stored on a national database because she got into a beef on Twitter, dude. Now, we're talking about the police here. Surely they've got better things to be doing, right? Well, I can tell you they absolutely do have better things to be doing in the UK to the point where I've got another headline now that says now school children are to be taught how to treat knife wounds. New first aid classes are planned amid soaring numbers of teens being stabbed. Well, you know, maybe if the police weren't so busy chasing up people who use the wrong word on Twitter and might actually do something about the violent crime that is soaring in this country right now, maybe perhaps then children wouldn't be having to be taught how to deal with these stab wounds because maybe the police wouldn't be arresting Mrs. Innocent for saying something on Twitter and maybe, maybe, Charlie, they would just be doing their job. Well, I disagree with you because I like to. I would like to know how to treat stab wounds because I'm about to stab myself in the neck having to listen <laughs> to all this ridiculousness about, about teaching how to treat stab wounds while throwing people in, in jail for uh, name-shaming transsexuals. Think about what that did to that woman's children to see that, to have that happen, to be shown, it, not just in theory, but in, in actuality, to be shown what happens if you say something that's incongruent with the thought police, that the police will literally kick your door down, drag your mother out in handcuffs, take her away from you, fingerprint her, handcuff her, take her DNA, mugshot, throw her in a jail, and then let her out a couple hours later. Of course, she doesn't know when she's getting out. The kids don't know when she's getting out. The police don't care because what that, that you think that that ever goes away? That never goes away from a kid. They will always have that association somewhere in their subconscious, someplace. They will understand that if they speak out, it equals the police kicking your door down and throwing you in jail. The police only wish that they could do this with everybody. You know, I don't think that they see this as a problem. I think they say, see this as we're making an example of some people who's next. You know, this this is crazy. But this is what happens also when you have you take in the United States in particular, the heads of the police forces are shipped over to Israel for a training session with a company that trains the trains the police force on, on how to be more aggressive. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong, right, to train cops to be more aggressive? And then as part of that, the military has a program, a federal grant where they take their used equipment and give it to the police force, the police stations uh, around the country. They repaint it instead of it being, you know, the, if it's in Iraq, it's that, that tan color. Then it comes back, they paint it black, you know, of course, to make it look as scary as possible, which is why you see uh, armored personnel carriers in the street, you know, in city streets and small towns in the United States because they're being gifted that by the military. So all of this, this militarization of the police it with equipment, but also psychological militarization of the police is adding to this too. It's a, if you give somebody, you dress somebody up like a soldier and give them a rifle, they're going to go looking for something to shoot. And, and this is what, and this is what we have. We have a, we have a, a police uh, mentality in this state uh, that is so revved up and ready to throw people in jail for all kinds of useless things, whether it's selling loose cigarettes or having a small bag of weed in your back pocket or having a pocket knife in your sock or something, you know, whatever it is, they treat it as if you're 
drug kingpin and they're, they'll throw you in jail first and then assess, assess the situation afterwards. So I, I, I'd like to say I'm surprised about this story, but I'm really not because this is the direction it's going. And, and how much longer until, until Twitter is in fact, the one calling the police on well, the people. Well, you're mad crazy, dude. I was just about to say to you, in cahoots with the police, you've got people like Twitter and Facebook. Mm -hmm. And the other day, I was highlighting Mark Zuckerberg's story where he was saying, now, I'm going to make it all a lot more cosier, a lot more comfortable. <laughs> just turn down the lights a little bit. Relax. Don't worry about it. Nobody can see what you're posting. We're going to put end-to-end -end encryption on there so that even we don't know what you're posting. We want you to be yourself. Just let your hair down, you know? Yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. Charlie. Now, end-to-end -end encryption, they're trying to kid people on that nobody is seeing these messages. And for me, the police and social media, now you could say they're working in cahoots, dude. Absolutely in cahoots. Because the minute something is said on social media, we can look at that story there. The police are at your door because of words that you used. So the two of them, well, it's hard to yeah. separate police and social media now. No, and part of the reason why uh, the co-founders of WhatsApp left Facebook was because of this. This this was part of the this was part of their reasoning. They said we're done. We're cashing in our our stocks and we're we're out of here. We don't want any part of this because part of what WhatsApp uh, that Facebook acquired for seventeen billion dollars was that th it was encrypted. Yeah, and Facebook said we want to we want to take we want to make it so that it's not as encrypted. And the the co-founder said, "Well, then count us out. I'm going to go play with my Porsche collection and count my money because he's not interested in this because that's because it's inherent. It's just the exact opposite of what they had set out to do with their with their program. And so Facebook, look, Facebook is no good. They're no good. They're they're they're. they're 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 taking information and reselling it. This I know this conversation is about Twitter and about what you know what. They're all the same, Charlie. In, see, it, see in my book, same. I think they're all the same. We need to yeah. stop differentiating between the different tech companies at that level because they're all in bed together. They're all eating at the same table and they're all banning the same people on the same days. We can see there's definite collusion there. And let's go to Facebook then, right? Because you were mentioning to me something about the Three Thought Project. Six million yes. people gone. Gone. Yeah. So um, I'll read this. This is just a little bit from the the, it's the as the Free Thought Project has previously reported. The phrase "Facebook is a private company" is not accurate, as they have formed a partnership with an insidious neoconservative think tank known as the Atlantic Council, which is directly funded and made up of groups tied to the pharmaceutical industry, the military industrial complex, and even government itself. The Atlantic Council dictates to Facebook who is allowed on the platform and who is purged. So this is what, you know, for all those people that are saying, I think that Facebook is throttling my reach, you're not imagining it, it's happening. It's been exposed. This is what they're doing. Um, they're, they're, uh, uh, everybody knows that Facebook's taking their information and selling it. And I'm going to get into something about that in a minute. But this is this is um, the Atlantic Council is funded by the United States government. Okay, they're also they receive a lot of money from these these various industries. And I've got the website up on the screen just now, and it looks like a globalist get together. You've got Macron oh, yeah. on there. You've got Brexit going on the the ticker, and and then you've got Theresa Mayhem, my favorite politician of all. So it's like a globalist uh, orgy on this website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Think of Bilderberg. It's like it's like Bilderberg. And so they set policy, and they go after these social media platforms. And you know, and if you're a social media platform. You're you're trying to run a business. Let's say let's just say that you started it with with just to try and start a, a company and you're a dot com geek. Let's say that let's pretend for a second that the CIA didn't start Facebook, which of course they did. Um, you know, you're just minding your own business, trying to put this product together, and the government comes to you and says, "You've got this really interesting uh, platform going on. We'd like to sort of help tweak it a little bit." And you say, "No, thanks. We're not interested." Knowing exactly what. The government has in, has in mind. Well, what do you think happens to that company at that point? You think they start to lose their investors? You think they start to have uh, taxation tax problems? You think they start to find uh, lawsuits and and injunctions that get filed against them? Of course, this is how the government the government plays dirty. So they so even if they didn't want to cooperate with the government, which I think they do, but even if we assume that they didn't want to, they'll be put in a situation where they're forced to. 
or their company will be destroyed. So they say, well, listen, we're, we just want the Atlantic Council to come in and help out on this. So it doesn't look like it's really coming from the government. It looks like it's coming from this think tank. And hey, we like thinking. We like think tanks, right? They're just going to come in here and help, help us out. They're going to give us a broader idea of how we should be changing. These think tanks like the Atlantic Council are the problem. OK, and they are set up, they are run by globalist scumbags. And this is how things get done. This is how policy gets made in a way that doesn't I set call off it, alarm bells. I call it like policy by proxy, censorship yeah. by proxy, because it keeps the government's hands just clean enough to give them, yeah. you know, that, that, that kind of air of, well, it's not us doing this. You know, we can't get involved here. Right. And another layer of that is what we talked about last uh, a couple of times ago, which is NewsGuard. You know, start up a new company that comes in and says, we'll give you the red, green and yellow or red, yellow and green um, rating system for these websites. So you can tell whether or not they're fake news. And then Facebook or Google or Twitter or whoever can say, we're not the ones censoring it. We have NewsGuard doing this. If you have a problem with this ranking system, take it up with NewsGuard, not us. So then it gives them a layer of um, of plausible deniability where they can just say, well, listen, you know, we're just using their their service, but we're not them. But, um, you know, th this is this is a problem that Facebook has. Um, first of all, they've been in trouble by I mean, people have discovered that I think that the estimate was half of their accounts are fake. Half half of them. They've got billions of people, but it turns out that, that most of them are, are fake and, and dead. Then they're going after um, alternative media. We've seen that. People have said, oh, they're going after conservative talking point. Well, I don't know that that's necessarily limited to conservatives. I think they're going after anybody that is anti-war and anti-pharmaceutical um, You see, the left, the left were happy when it looked like it was just the right that they were going after. But as we've seen over time, it's morphed. It's not just the right they're after. That was just setting the precedent for now whoever they want to go after, Charlie. Yeah, well, it looks a lot like if you remember WikiLeaks. When WikiLeaks came out in 2004 or five with the collateral damage video, who was on their side? The Democrats. They were like, you get that, that MF or George Bush, you get them, you get it. Then when the, all the stuff came out about Obama and Hillary Clinton funneling weapons to Libya or Fast and Furious, then all of a sudden the Democrats were like, oh, we have to get WikiLeaks now. Oh, so you liked them when they were pick when they were pointing out the the uh, the lies and deception with the Bush administration. But as soon as they they start exposing Obama, then that now you guys are up in arms about it. Just shows how hypocritical this whole Republican Democrat system is. As long as if they're going after the other team, then they're then they're big fans. I remember, you know, oh, what about even Donald Trump? Oh, WikiLeaks is the greatest. They're the greatest. What is he saying now? Uh, uh, Julian Assange needs to be hung. Oh, okay, really? I wonder who told you to think that way. Exactly. I mean, this is, this, so, so, so it's it's that way with WikiLeaks. It's this way with with Facebook. Yeah. The, it, it, at the time, they're saying, "Oh, they're coming after these conservative voices." You get the get Alex Jones, get him off here. Did you really think it's going to stop with Alex Jones? Do you really not understand? The I, I'm worried about hey. Alex, dude. I, I I've been watching him recently, and I'm quite worried about the guy. He is under so much pressure. And he gets so much grief, he truly does. A lot of it he brings on himself, don't get me wrong. Yeah. But what no, no, pressure no, that guy is under, man. Honestly, it, it's unthinkable what he's going through, to be honest with you. You know, that's one guy that when they say he threw himself off a building, it might actually turn out to be true, <laughs> you know, because he is under a ton of stress. It's going to end badly for him. Yeah. For sure. Although he might be... If he, I don't know that I'm, I'm, may, I'm. This is a stretch, but just hear me out here. What if he, he does understand how this, these things play out? What if he is creating his own insanity to give himself and a way out of this? You know, to 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 make him almost like a caricature of himself. Well, absolutely, because so even in court, he, his court, he said it was an act. Some of the stuff that he does as well, his lawyer said that. So I can, I can play along with you here. I he can see what you... He said, he's, he said I'm kind of retarded. Yeah. Uh, that on, was uh, funny on Joe Rogan. Yeah, Rogan. I'm just a little bit Joe retarded. Under his desk. <laughs> he was literally, folks, if you haven't seen that part, go and watch that, because like Charlie says, Joe was literally under the desk laughing at him. But, you know, we often yeah. laugh about, well, we often take apart Zuckerberg on here and other billionaires like him. But I got a laugh the other day, Charlie, because we often hear about them, you know, building their hideouts and their bunkers and all these kind of places where they're going to go and run away to when the shit hits the fan, right? Yeah. 
but this here from the Inquirer, and I'll bring it up on the screen now, says, and I had to laugh at this, he's that paranoid that Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg has an escape shoot built into his boardroom office. Now, if that doesn't tell you that this guy is feeling guilty about something, I honestly don't know what will. Yeah, yeah, you, you don't you don't build escape hatches <laughs> when everything you're doing is above board and in the best interest of humanity. Um, you, the torches and pitchforks are going to be coming for Mr. Zuckerberg at some point. But you know what they've done, and we'll, we can get into this after, on the other side of the break. But what they've done is they've stolen Facebook has stolen a, a page out of Monsanto's uh, game plan, and that is they've they've plucked a bunch of people out of government and given them cushy jobs with Facebook to keep that public private. Uh, uh, revolving door going and some of the people that are in positions of authority within Facebook are straight out of the Obama administration and so for people that come out and say well you know they're they're silencing conservative voices and you know that's probably because when you pr- Put a bunch of people from the Obama White House in high-ranking positions at Facebook. You're going to get that. It's like you're when Monsanto gave um, Donald Rumsfeld the job. Remember, he they employed Rumsfeld to get like mm-hmm. the Roundup pushed through and things like that. It's that revolving door that you see with big pharma, big tech now. All the big industries they have this collusion, this r- relationship with government, where it's the same players turn up in all the different roles. Yeah, it's it's if you think of it from a strategic standpoint of for these companies and you take you know the soul out of it it's a smart smart move because you bring in these people that have government connections and what that allows you to do is not just get your not just get your company in a in a better position but it can also eliminate your competition they can force them out of business. They can, if for anyone that doesn't play ball, they can go out right well, after them. We are on the break. One hour down already on this time travel edition of the Kev, ba- Kev Baker Show. The new world order is going down, and it's with help from my friends like Charlie Robinson that we're doing that. Charlie Robinson, the author of The Octopus of Global Control, he's here with me tonight, and we are tearing apart everything going on, especially in the technological realm tonight. Facebook, Twitter, social media. We tackled the Chelsea Manning situation at the start of the show before. But we're going to stay on Facebook and companies like that momentarily because before the break, Charlie, you rightly pointed out the fact that there's a revolving door mentality between government and big tech. And you've got some of the names of some of the players there that we're talking about. Yeah, so Facebook's head of security, uh, otherwise known as the man that the man that can ban people, uh, is a guy named Nathaniel Gleischer. Before he was censoring people at Facebook, he prosecuted cyber crimes at the U.S. Department of Justice and served as director of cybersecurity policy uh, at the National Security Council in the Obama White House. Now, the Obama White House is going to become a recurring theme when it comes to people leaving politics and going to work at Facebook. They basically poached almost the entire um, tech uh, uh, industry uh, that was that was working within, within the White House under Obama and brought them over. So for people that are saying, well, you know, they're, they're censoring conservative voices. Of course they are. That's that's what they would do if given the chance. They were trying to do that for years with Obama. Um, I, it's no surprise that they would do that as well when they got to Facebook. So you've got another guy. You've got um, David Recordin. He was the former director of IT for Obama's White House. He is um, an engineering director at Facebook. He His role at the White House, he returned to the position after he, he's kind of gone back and forth, which a lot of this is a, a something that happens a lot in the pharmaceutical industry where they'll go from the FDA or the CDC into uh, big, big companies like Merck and Pfizer and then back into the FDA, CDC and then back again and back. You know, so they they do this in um because they 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 help out from both both ends. So another person, Meredith Cardin, who came from the Obama administration once again, she joined Facebook uh, to be part of their quote news integrity team, which is <laughs> about as hilarious and ironic as you can get to come from the Obama White House and be in charge of the news and integrity team. Gee, what could what, what that sounds what like a role. It, does, it sounds like a job out of Orwell's 1984, doesn't it? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, stuffing news into the memory hole um, and pretending like things aren't really happening. This is um, the, this Facebook is it's a problem. <laughs> they really, really are. That they're, they're not even kidding. So there's another. They've they've got guys named David Palouf, Josh Higgins, Lauren o o Becci, Danielle. Uh, Sorinko Gordinyuk, Sarah Pollock, Ben Forer, Bonnie Calvin, Julianne Sun. These are all people that have come from the Obama administration straight into Facebook. So they're 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 working on that, but they're not. It's not solely limited to the Obama administration because, like any good multinational conglomerate, they understand that it's better to control everything and get both parties in. So they also went ahead and hired. Um, some people that they thought were, you know, coming in from the from the right side. So Joel David Kaplan, he's Facebook's vice president of global public policy. Prior to this, his major role at Facebook, his he was the um, he took the place of Karl Rove in the White House <laughs> as White House deputy chief of staff for George W. Bush. So then you've got Myra Jordan with was a special policy assist policy assistant in the Bush White House who was hired on as policy manager for Facebook. What a surprise. So you've got these authoritarian uh, maniacs that come out of the Bush and Obama White House and they go straight into Facebook. And if Facebook is supposed to be this platform where everybody's having an honest conversation about things and they're posting, you know, hey, I went to dinner at this place and, and hey, you know, I, I, I put post this meme, then why do you have so many globalists out of the, the White House in positions of authority within this organization, if it's so honest and just a, just a, oh, just a bunch of people getting together, sharing some positive <laughs> ideas. It's none of that stuff. This is control. They want to, they want to limit the people that are in there, um, you know, like you and me, it's a uh, data, having discussions. It's a data harvesting operation and it's the no, data, the data that will be used to control all of us when it comes to social credit scoring, stuff like that. And I like the fact you bring up the left and the right going through the revolving door, because again, this just it offers more evidence to what I say about politics, left and right, two cheeks of the one mutated asshole called politics. Mm -hmm. There's no difference yep. between them, dude. No, and, and it doesn't stop there. So not only are they staffing uh, the ranks with people right out of the White House, but they're getting they're also partnering up with other big tech firms and selling data to them. Um, do you remember uh, do you remember like just a couple of weeks ago, Google got busted for doing this. They got busted for their Nest thermostat when it was discovered that, hey, they have a microphone in there. What did Google come out and say? Oh, we're really sorry it was an accident. Really? An accident? You, ac you accidentally added a microphone to the thermostat? Who believes that? I mean, but but this is Google, do no evil. You, we're just, we're just, you know, we're just, you know, information. Really, well, you've got Google, you've got Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Alphabet, the parent company of Google, on video saying, how many, you know, how many results do you get when you type in a question into Google? You get thousands. And he said, that's a bug. You should only get one answer, the right answer every time. So the people that are in charge of giving you the right answer are also secretly putting microphones in your thermostats and then acting stupid when they get caught saying, oh, we had no idea. It, it, it's, it's, it's so insulting to our intelligence and it's so frustrating that they are actually trying to pass this off as being the truth. Um, and why we continue to trust these people is beyond me. You know, Eric Schmidt stepped down from his role uh, as as the CEO years ago, right when all the pedophile stuff came out. I wonder if that's a coincidence. I wonder if people have looked into that. I wonder if that had anything to do with it. I wonder Eric if Schmidt he was uh, flying on the Lolita Express with uh, oh. Bill Clinton <laughs> and and Donald Trump. That's, that's something yeah, that Trump Donald supporters Trump. seem to forget. That's a convenient mm -hmm. kind of a uh, memory gap that they have that he parties with Epstein as well. You're bang on, dude. Yeah, for sure. So... Mark Zuckerberg told Congress in April, quote, we don't sell data to anyone, which is a lot. <laughs> how how <laughs> I mean, the hell does their business to... work then, Charlie? I mean, come on, how do you become a, mil a billionaire of a free website if you're not selling something? It's like me saying I write books, but I don't sell them. Yeah. I, I, just, it, I just write them why? and keep them here for myself. It's just for my own personal, you know? Sure. Yeah. So, but but there's a problem with this because based on hundreds of internal Facebook documents, uh, the New York Times investigation published uh, a couple of days ago 
uh, well, more like, I'd say two months ago, uh, they published that, um, in fact, Facebook does sell access to data, not just to p other people, but they sell it to, uh, they sold it to Netflix, Microsoft, Spotify, Amazon, and Apple. And the revelations highlight, once again, the company's lack of transparency and accountability when it comes to the collection, processing, and the sharing of user data. So what it showed was that Facebook gave these partners, these big businesses, the ability to read, write, and delete messages, as well as access to the names and contact details of friends, all without explicit consent. Meaning they sold your information to all of these companies. Information, these companies could read your Facebook messages. They could read, do you remember the push to get everybody on to Facebook Messenger on your, on your mobile phone? That saying that you can't you can't use it unless you agree you download that part of it. I'm sure that was part of it. I mean, I don't have that. I still can't get messages on my cell phone Facebook app. We're old I school, Charlie. We're, we're old school. We do the email thing, man. We're, yeah, right. Exactly. We're new old school. No. <laughs> yeah, right. So they 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 told you know Zuckerberg testified in front of Congress also that that um, users have complete control of everything that they that they um, share on Facebook, and it's not true. He's once again, he's lying. I don't know if this is going to come as a surprise to people that Mark Zuckerberg is a liar, but he is a liar. I mean, there was been, a, he's been yeah, there was a, over and over again. There was a story over here in the UK a few years ago about a girl who was in Asda, and that's like our Walmart. And she was shopping and went to the clothing section, and she got a bit of a fright, so she did, because she's seen herself on a t shirt. Now, long yeah. story short, what had happened was because she had posted that image on Facebook, well, in that 50 pages that nobody reads when you accept the terms at the start, they own all of your images, all of everything you post on there. And they had basically sold that to a third party company who had then used it on a T-shirt for marketing. So this is exactly the way that they make their money. It's ridiculous for anyone to think out there that it's not about selling your data. So here's here's the details of what they what they what their arrangement with these with these other companies with Yahoo they struck a deal giving it the ability to display Facebook users news feeds including friends posts on the search company's homepage Yahoo got rid of the feature in 2012 but as of last year it still had access to data for close to 100,000 people a month Spotify Netflix and the Royal Bank of Canada signed a contract allowing them to read write and delete users' private messages and to see all participants on a thread. The company said they were unaware they had such broad powers. Amazon oh, was come permitted on. to- Are we meant to believe Amazon, that. I mean, who's who's the bigger liar here? Spotify, Netflix, and the Bank of Canada or Facebook? <laughs> I'd say they're all lying. All in bed um, together. Amazon was permitted to obtain users' names and contact information through their friends. As of last year, the documents show Amazon could access Facebook user emails through their friends. In exchange, Facebook was given access to contact lists from the e-commerce giant to gain deeper insight into people's relationships and suggest more connections. And then with Apple... They were given, Apple was given special powers to hide the fact it was asking for users' Facebook data iPhones and iPads also had access to the contact numbers and calendar entries of people who had changed their account settings to disable all sharing, the records show. Apple claims it was not aware of the broad powers Facebook granted <laughs> it and said any personal information never left the devices. Okay, so do you believe that? Nobody does. So the last part is that Facebook signed a consent agreement with the Federal Trade Commission, that's the FTC, back in 2011, barring the social media network from sharing user data without explicit permission. The company says its data deals did not breach that agreement because they viewed their partners as extensions of the company. <laughs> if you so believe, they don't if, consider they don't consider Amazon, Apple, Netflix, the Bank of of Canada, uh, or any of these other companies to be different companies. They see them as extensions of Facebook, to well, which experts obviously disagree. I'm sitting here holding my hands in the air, full justification of the other night when I done the the 
pimping out of the internet panopticon, I was saying that there's no difference between these companies. They may have different logos, they may have different rules, they may have different business models. Absolutely, on the face of it, couldn't be more kind of um, different. However, you dig beneath the surface and you see that they are all tied together. And to use your analogy, you know, the, the octopus, you can have Spotify, you can have Netflix, you can have Apple. All of them are just like little suckers on the one tentacle of the octopus that is social media. And make no mistake about it, folks, they are all in bed together. Well, and they're geographically, most of them are located close to each other, too. They're most they're all in Silicon Valley, with the exception, I think, I think Spotify isn't, but but maybe but I'm sure they have an office there. Everybody does. So if they're not if they're not all chatting with each other uh, in town in the San Francisco area, then they're at Sun Valley or they're at Davos or they're at Bilderberg or they're at Council on Foreign Relations. They're at all the or they're at the Atlantic Council. They're at all these meetings. These guys are all buddies. They're all on the golf course together. They're discussing these things. This is not this is not uh, some sort of secret proprietary thing where nobody wants to share any information with the other ones. They have realized that they are stronger if they work together with one another. Facebook wants Amazon's wants access to Amazon's people. Amazon wants access to Facebook's people, of course. So they do a deal together that you know there'll be some overlap, of course, but but they'll work together and it's stronger. And then by because of their relationship through these government uh, scumbags that they bring in there to run their public policy. They they figure out the loopholes and they find the protect the protection rackets that, that so that the government protects them from any sort of things. That's why Zuckerberg has no problem going to Congress and lying his brains out because he knows nothing's going to happen to him. That's why they have the audacity to say to the FTC um, that even though they asked him in 2011, told them not to um, share users' data without explicit permission, they just say, oh well we don't consider it sharing because these are our brothers here at, at Apple and Amazon and they're extensions of our company. So therefore we're not really actually doing anything wrong. We're just letting them take a look because we consider them part of the family. It's, it's, it's infuriating, but it's also not surprising because this is what you get. This is corp corporatocracy this is this is the blend this is the, the a type of fascism when you're blending big business with government this is what you I mean, get mussolini describes this as pure fascism the merger of yeah. corporations and government and it's never been so obvious charlie no it's never been and and, and like i said they they can they can insulate and and, and allow these companies to grow and you wonder well, why would they want these companies to grow well, they would want them to grow because they they financed them in the beginning to begin with through InQtel, which is the CIA's venture capital arm. And I proposed that Sequoia Capital is involved in this as well, because if you take a look at that venture capital firm, they got a lot of deep state companies in there that they've 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 put hundreds of billions of dollars into over over. Well, they have hundreds of billions of dollars in market value, but they've put billions of dollars into um, in seed rounds and in and, and, and subsequent rounds after seed financing. So they, they've been involved in this from the beginning. So, so if you say, well, how could they control this big behemoth? Well, if you control the venture capital companies like InQtel or Sequoia Capital or Kleiner Perkins, whatever, I mean, you name it, there's a ton of them. You don't really need to control all of the company. You just need to control the board of directors that these venture capital aren't uh, companies because if you do that and by the way they are controlled yep. they're invited to all the things the Davoses and Sun Valley that's who and, makes and all up your that's who makes up your Bilderberg agendas now you're like your attendee yeah. list and you're absolutely right dude yeah it's scary but this is this this is this is how it goes and this is why Facebook is still around and they're not they haven't turned into Friendster or MySpace and you know because people... they got friends in high places yeah and of course LifeLog that was the original mm -hmm. program out of the Pentagon, out of DARPA. Yeah. It finished on one day. And literally that same day, we're meant to believe, just like we're meant to believe it was a mistake that there was microphones in the Nest stuff from Google. It's just a coincidence then that Mark Zuckerberg had his big idea that very same day to start up something very similar called the Facebook. Oh, well, nothing I mean, nothing to, to here, yeah, no, Kev, and, move along. You see, this is why I highlight a lot, Charlie, because I think it's really important that in Silicon Valley in particular, I think you would agree that you've got these venture capital companies, these, these guys with the money, and you've also got DARPA. And it's like yeah. DARPA like to throw money at everything. 
because if one thing takes off that they can get an advantage out of, they want to be in there first. So I think a lot of people, even in our circles, forget that all of the seed money, like you're saying, all of the initial kind of financing, all of this came from the military industrial complex. Sergey yeah. Brin, his paper to MIT, basically thanked the military industrial complex in opening because without them, he would never have had the money to write his algorithm that went on to be Google search. It's so blatant. It's all military industrial complex. And, you know, I think you've got a new term apart from the military industrial complex, don't you? <laughs> see, see. As a matter of fact, I do. Nice I little segue there. See, I remember. Nice yeah. segue. I think that the uh, the term military industrial complex, which was coined by Eisenhower back in the 50s, has has become a bit stale. And I think there's a better name for it. And it is the military information terror complex. That is the three components that work together to silence suppression, uh, su silence any sort of dissent, to finance the mainstream media, to work with the military, these military um, contractors. They work well together. A list. I want to read off just a to give you an idea of well, who I think. I'll is I'll add to you, right? List. I'll add to yours before you rattle off the list. I think it should be the oh. military information terror pharmaceutical prison complex mm -hmm. they're that, that, all, that's about, that's all of it. yep this is not meant to be a thorough list but this is part of what's in the upcoming book but the, the military component all the the major ones you would expect boeing general dynamics bae lockheed martin General Electric, TRW, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, United Technologies, Halliburton, Aegeus, Shell, Dow Chemical, KBR, Triple Canopy, Exxon, BP Amico, Rolls-Royce, SAIC, G4S, Serco, DynCorp, Airbus, Chevron, Honeywell, Bechtel, L3 Communications. These are all parts of the military part. The information component, names that you'll everyone will recognize. Google Alphabet, Facebook, Instagram, Associated Press, Twitter, Amazon, Yahoo, Apple, Intel, EMC, InQtel, D-Wave, Axiom, Experian, DataLogix, Epsilon, CoreLogix, 23andMe, Time Warner, Sony, Comcast, CNN, Washington Post, News Corp, Disney, New York Times, PBS, Newsweek, CBS, Sony, MSNBC, Viacom, Reuters, Black Cube, National Amusements, Crisis Cast. And the last part, the terror portion. This one is, is alarming. NSA, CIA, FBI, Department of Defense, Mossad, NATO, MI5, MI6, GCHQ, Department of Homeland Security, Department of State, KGB, TSA, APAC, Booz Allen Hamilton, RAND Corporation, Stratfor, CFR, DARPA, Carlyle Group, Blackstone, United Nations, IAI, Heritage Foundation, Cato Institute, Club of Rome, Bohemian Club. It goes on and on and on. So that gives you an idea. So these groups have expanded beyond military industrial complex. It's not just bomb makers and airplane manufacturers anymore. It's beyond that now. It's well, information. You, you brought up G4S there, an interesting yeah. story. When I got out of the army and things and the Gulf War started again, the second Gulf War, I was actually severely tempted to take on one of these like private contractor jobs. Yeah. And G4S, yeah, they, they were one of the ones that were offering an arm and a leg and a kidney and everything else for anyone willing to go over there. They're literally talking about ex-soldiers sleeping on bundles of money. They were getting paid that much. And G4S now, what they are today, over here in Scotland, every, anyway, they're absolutely everywhere, dude. Everywhere. They've got all our everywhere. security. They've got prison contracts. They are everywhere. They are. That This is who's in control. They've outsourced the war. Yep. They've outsourced it to uh, Triple Canopy and Aegeus and, and former Blackwater Academies, Z, whatever you want to call it. I was going to say, what are they now? They've had that many names since Blackwater. I can't keep up. I know. Well, and Eric Prince is back in the news again, saying he wants Congress to privatize the Afghanistan war. I mean, this this is 
What's what's happening? It's, is the opium output dropping now that the Taliban are coming back into power? Do we need Blackwater in there to get the opium lines opened up again? Is that what we're talking about, Charlie? Yeah, because Blackwater won't ask any questions. They won't come home like Pat Tillman and and start trying to talk about things. They're paid too much. They're wow. paid to keep their mouth shut. There's a name. There is a name, Monday. I got into that with Ryan Gable uh, yesterday. Um, we, we we talked about how how repulsive that was. He was a guy who gave up everything. Gave up everything to go and represent and fight for his country because he bought into everything, and rightly so, patriotic. And look yeah. at the treatment of him, dude. That that. That story for anyone out there, I mean, we could probably do a whole show on that, but you can Google that, get into it. It's disgusting. Yeah, he saw, he, he, he you know, the, the power of the media. You know, he saw what happened on 9-11, and he wanted to give it all up and fight, you know, football, and playing football, making millions of dollars, that none of that stuff is important. What really matters is, um, you know, the security of, of our country and all this, and he bought into it, and then they used him to sell that turd of a war to the American public. And as soon as he started talking out against it, he was dead. And yep. that wasn't an accident. No, that that was um, an ambush of uh, false flag proportions, shall we say. I can't believe it, Charlie. Yeah. We, we've only got one more segment to go. So when's your podcast with Ryan going to be broadcast? Because I'll certainly be wanting to hear this one. It should be out Thursday. Good. Good stuff. I love yeah. Ryan. And he'll be back on I here, of course, on Wednesday. Like I said, when I was speaking to Ryan, I said to him, listen, you're going to love Charlie Robinson because for people out there, Ryan is exactly the same cool dude off air as he is on it. So I thought these two guys are going to be a match made in info heaven. And I've had Ryan messaging me to say, wow, Charlie Robinson. I've had Charlie messaging me to say, wow, Ryan Gable. I'm just glad it went <laughs> it's well, a love dude. fest, I admit it. <laughs> no, I, I think we're all making the connections at this time that we need to, you, you know, and especially with what we've been talking about tonight, you know, the fact that the mainstream media, we say it every time, they've been co-opted. And it's good that we can all pull together in this little conspiracy that we're in and try and get the real information out there. It's all we can do. Yeah. Well, when we get back from the break, we're going to take on a a, a less polarizing topic, nice. and that is vaccines. <laughs> oh, excellent. Because, of course, vaccines, I mean, they're not uh, far from the social media kind of uh, memory hole when it comes to anti-vaxxers. That's very much in the news right now. And I always remember Dr. Andrew Wakefield over here in the UK, and he made a connection between the MMR vaccination and autism. Now, he basically got chased out of the UK, he moved over to the U.S. I think he went to Texas, opened up a practice there. But for me, you need to listen to Andrew Wakefield and other people like him because they really do have the science that the controllers don't want you to know. This is the Cam Baker Show. Final segment on today's Kev Baker Show. So for anyone in the U.K., who turned up at the normal time of 10 p.m., mark your alarm clocks, your diaries, your calendars, whatever it is you do. We start one hour earlier in the UK this week. I'm not sure when the UK clocks go forward, but our American brothers and sisters, their clocks went forward at the weekend. So we're on at the earlier time of 9 p.m. in the UK for one week at least. I'll uh, check on that after the show and let people know when we'll be going back to the normal time. But that's right, it's time travel week here on the Kev Baker Show. So for tonight, we're not talking anything about time travel. We're getting into vaccinations now. And Charlie, Charlie, let me tell you, since we last spoke, I was looking online and I figured out my old regiment. They had some of the Pass Out Parade videos on YouTube. And the Royal Signals, you know, they've got their Facebook group. And I went searching one day and I found the year that I joined the army. And I, I went to look at the basic training that I went through. And it was only when I was watching that that it all came flooding back to me because it shows you them getting thrown in for the haircut and you get thrown out the other door and from there you go to the medical centre. And it's at the medical centre that I always used to say, you know, just kind of nonchalantly, they would t treat us like pincushions with the vaccinations mm -hmm. that roll up your sleeves and they're totally at you. And I watched it. I actually watched it on this video and it brought it back to me just how many vaccinations that we got on that one day alone. And that's without the subsequent ones whenever we were going abroad or anything else. If something nasty started happening in the world, first thing they would start doing, vaccinate people in case we had to go there. 
So these vaccinations, it's always something that's been very, very high on my mind. And in recent times now, we have seen Facebook, Twitter, basically all the same social media companies, they're now clamping down on anyone who has anything negative to say about vaccinations. Now, if you look at the history, especially in recent times, of things that have gone wrong to do with vaccinations, I think it's quite right that people are allowed a platform to share their views, to highlight to other parents out there some of the dangers that medical professionals would rather go unsaid. But you've been looking into this, dude. What's happening? What's the latest? Well, you're seeing... The, the Free Thought Project is part of this as well. They were When they got deplatformed by Facebook and their 6 million um, subscribers that they had, they part of part of what did it was they're talking about vaccines. And the vaccine, in, the vaccine discussion is not even a discussion anymore. They don't want to have it. And you look into who Facebook partnered with, the Atlantic Council, and who finances them, like we said, and it is part of the funding comes from the pharmaceutical industry. They're, they're a part of the Atlantic Council. So they have a vested interest in keeping this off of Facebook. And this is what you have, this is what happens when, not just with vaccines, but with any topic. When you can't win the argument, you try to make sure the argument doesn't happen at all. And with the pharmaceutical industries, they don't want to have this argument. They don't want to have the discussion because when they have the discussion and the facts get brought into it, they lose and they know it. And there's billions of dollars at stake. And so instead of actually having an honest discussion about this, where you bring in one side and then the other side comes in and you guys talk it and work it out, they don't want that. There is only room for one side in this. It is if you don't get back, if you are not pro vaccination, then you are anti science, anti America, anti children, and we hope your kids die. That is it. So whereas the the anti-vaxxers, I don't even know if that's the right term to call them. This is like the 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 side that wants wants to have the discussion and wants to bring science into this. They're not anti-science. Anti-vaccine people are not anti-science. There is a component that are like, you know, I'm just gonna put it in God's hands and hope for the best. Okay, there is a small percentage that does that. And that is anti-vaccine, anti-science, anti responsibility right that there's there's that but the vast majority of anti-vaccine people are pro-science that's why they're anti-vaccine because they're pro-science not they're not throwing science out as the pro-vaccine side would have you believe they are in fact using science to prove that there are gigantic problems with the vaccinations and if you don't believe that then the next question is why has the vaccination compensation fund paid out four billion dollars to sick people that were that were harmed by vaccinations? You know who else paid out four billion dollars in damages for hurting people? The Catholic Church, and it is known that they are filled with it's rampant with pedophiles. That is not even debatable. It is a known fact, and they've paid out four billion dollars. What do you think the pharmaceutical is, industry is filled with? It's filled with a bunch of lies and deceptions. And there's so much money, just like the church, that they can't afford for this, this information to get out because it will take them down and they know it. In 1986 in the United States, Congress passed the, uh, a law that protected the vaccine manufacturers from being sued. Now think about that for a second. Why would you need to do that? Why would you tilt the favor, the table in favor of the pharmaceutical industry in that way? I know why the pharmaceutical industry would lobby Congress to do that. It's a genius thing to do, so they don't ever have to pay out for their, for their mistakes. But I put this in the book. You know, they they mandate that people get seventy four different vaccines in the United States. Seven, so how good whoa, do you whoa, think? whoa, 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 seventy four. That's, that's the schedule. Damn, it's going dude. up. There's three hundred more pending, so it's going to be through the roof. What would happen? What do you think would be in my book? If I had Congress mandate that everybody had to buy 74 copies of my book, do you think it'd be any good? Probably not. It'd be filled with a bunch of dick jokes and they'd be bad ones at that. Because <laughs> what would be my incentive to make it write a good book when everybody has to buy it? Exactly. 74. There'd be no incentive. So I want to read you something that I put in the book that has to do with this. And, and I'm going to preface this by saying, everybody grab your barf buckets in advance because it's going to start with a Hillary Clinton quote. The sky is blue. The science is settled. Vaccines work. Hillary Clinton. I have a rebut to that. I say, 
Roses are red. The sky is blue. You aren't the president because people don't trust you. And vaccines actually contain formaldehyde, antifreeze, lead, aluminum, mercury, and animal viruses. So the science is absolutely not settled. If people questioning vaccines are going to be called out for not being doctors, then politicians promoting vaccines need to be called out for not being doctors as well. Let's be fair about it. Then this is a quote from Dr. Rima Labo. You might recognize her. She was the wife of General Stubblebein, who was one of the high-ranking yeah. U.S. military people that called out 9-11 for what it was. She says, whenever, quote, the science is settled, it's no longer science, it is religion. Where there is risk, there must be consent. So, I go on to say there's a po poker term called being pot committed that is roughly defined as the act of having put in so many chips that you might as well follow through to the end of the hand. Another way to say it is that you've gone past the point of no return. The vaccine industry is pot committed at this point because they would open themselves up to unimaginable legal liability if they were ever to concede that their products damage children. They have no incentive to do anything other than stick to their story at this point. So that's how I feel about that. So that even though they're protected by the 1986 uh, vaccination, uh, I forget the exact term, I've yeah. got it somewhere, but the, the, de def the defending them from, uh, indemnifying them from lawsuits. This is a huge problem. If you're waiting for the pharmaceutical industry to say, oh, okay, all right, we admit it. Some of our products maybe aren't the best for people. It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. And if you dig into this deeper and you try and find out, you find out what's actually in the vaccines and you bring this to somebody's attention that is pro-vaccination, they think that you're the crazy person. But if I opened up a lemonade stand and I had formaldehyde, and polysorbate 80, and glyphosate, and, and thermarosol, and I was trying to sell this as lemonade, they'd drag me down to the police station and lock me up, as rightfully and so. And rightly so, but dude. You, yeah. But, they, but you can take all this and inject it into a child, a newborn whose immune system isn't, isn't fully developed. This is crazy. Okay, yeah. it's not, this isn't even about science anymore. This is about the pharmaceutical industry making money and suppressing anybody that has legitimate complaints about this. I know a lady who had a two year old daughter, took their daughter, took her daughter in for the MMR shots. I don't know if it was the first one or the second one. That girl, that da her daughter never spoke from that point forward. She said, My daughter has never said, Mommy, I love you. Okay, so. I dare these people to go have that conversation with that lady and tell her that it's all in her head, that she's imagining this whole thing. Yeah, I, I, I dare you to do that to, to Andrew Wakefield or to, to Del Bigtree, who, who directed Vaxxed. Uh, these, these, the suppression of this information shows that there is that they do not want to actually have this debate because if they actually have the debate and facts are brought into it, they'll lose. Absolutely. In one country that we seem to be zeroing in on in recent times, Charlie. Australia. Be, Australia, yeah. And it says here, just one story I brought up from last year, and I believe this law is now passed. We've got Australians in the chat room, so they'll be able to keep us right here. This comes from Global News back in July last year, and you can take your pick of what source you go to. All the stories are out there. Australia penalises parents who don't vaccinate kids. Should Canada do the same? And this is what we're starting to see now across the board, isn't it? Basically, parents now getting into trouble if you don't vaccinate your children. I love, is... the, I love the, the question that they pose. They don't pose the question, should we not do this at all? It's, should Canada do it as well? Not, not, not should we investigate? By the way, Australian people are among the most awake out yep. there. Yeah, absolutely. I... Their, government, their government is filled with psychopathic maniacs, but the Australian people are super awake. And like I said, when we talked earlier um, last month, they were all over the place at Anarchapulco. I, I find a ton them, of, ton of them. They're I fantastic. Find, I find Australian people, they're so compatible and so similar yeah. to us Scots. You find a lot of them coming over here. God only knows why they come to cold Scotland to work in the summer. Who only, <laughs> who only knows? But I've always, always clicked with Australians. They're some of the most down-to-earth and awake people. Like you say, they take no nonsense. They really do. Yeah. And we've got a lot of Australian listeners to this show and the network. And I look at Australia nowadays. It's a globalist hellhole. It truly is. You can look at all of their policies, and it reads like something out of the EU. It's like a test bed for everywhere else.
Yeah, it's it's the 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 people are fantastic. The government is is totally backwards. But um, but you know, hopefully hopefully that'll change. I I just think that with regard to the vaccination topic, what what has ever what what hurt, what's the harm in discussing it? You know, what's exactly. the harm in having an honest discussion about it? Unless somebody they've got something not, to hide. Unless that's exactly it. That's that's where I was going. Yeah. Unless you have something to hide. This is not a this is not the behavior of somebody that is an, an innocent participant in this. This is the behavior of a suspect. This is what they don't want to talk about. Well, you don't want to talk about why don't you want to talk about? Why don't you want to get into it? They, they, the science is settled. Well, like Rima Labo said, when you hear the science is settled, that's that's when you know it's turned into religion. And and the science is not settled. The science might be settled on their point. They don't want to discuss it anymore. They're not. They haven't done some of the most basic studies, the placebo tests. The, 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 this is not like this is science 101, you know, and they don't want to do it. So you have to ask yourself, why don't they want to test a vaccinated population versus a non-vaccinated population? Give them one the shot, one you know, one and, placebo, and let's not and see even, the results. Let's not even get into the fact that they're saying that young lads have to have the vaccine for cervical cancer, the Gardasil shot. I mean, yeah, okay, whatever. And I've brought up a, a story here for people to, you know, they can go and Google this or whatever. But this is back at the time. Of, remember the bird flu, the, the huge bird flu yeah. thing that was going on? The government in Germany... They got a special vaccination, not the one that the public got, but they got a special clean vaccination at the time. So how come there's like two tiers of vaccinations then? How come they get a clean version as opposed to the standard version that the citizens get? That, that should because be they, red red flags. <laughs> being... Because they hate us. Exactly. They want dude. us all dead. The fact that they have a clean version to give the government, people should be up yeah. in arms. Sheeple, people should have, sheeple, that was a Freudian slip there. Yeah, the sheeple yeah. should have been protesting for sure, dude. Uh, this is, the, we have to take responsibility for this. Yep, as yep, people. yep. This is this this is not going to get sorted out by the government. It's not going to get sorted out by the pharmaceutical industries. They're not going to wake up one day and grow a conscience. It's not going to happen. They're, this is going to, this is going to, this is going to happen when, Enough people say, and I'm not trying. Listen, I'm not trying to say that every vaccine causes autism. No, That's I think not, we would agree, Charlie. I think we would agree in the early days before the adjuvants and the the additives that they added in there. There's definitely a science to vaccination. There's definitely sure. some good to that. It's the crap that they're putting in with it now, like you've been listing. That's the problem. Squalene, polysorbate, eighty aborted fetal tissue. I mean. I would like for someone to explain what those, those things don't occur naturally in these vaccines. They are added. So the question is, why are they added? Give me if somebody from the pharmaceutical I mean, industry can explain is... to me why 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 mercury is the second most deadly substance known to man behind I, only plutonium. I remember why in are school, you dude. That in the shots? Yeah, in school when we were young, if you broke a, a mercury thermometer. It was like radioactive waste had been spilt, dude. You'd evacuate the school, there'd be dudes with suits on. But now, no, it's okay. You can just inject it into your newborn I, child. That That's in the book. I made a list. There's a list of all the things that you do uh, according to science if, you, if you're if you exposed to mercury, if you break a thermometer. I it, make a bullet point list. It was of your book you, that reminded me, dude. Your book reminded me of that. Out. If you spill it on your carpet, you're supposed to cut your carpet out. You're also supposed to take your drapes off and throw them away because they could be infected by this. But but it's okay to in, inject thermarosol, which is 49% mercury, into children. I mean, it, the only it's not a question of whether or not it's safe. The only question is, what is the real goal here? Transhumanism what are they really for me, dude. To do? I think it's transhumanism. I think it's dumbing down, and I think it's greed over everything else. In the end of the day. Yeah. And it's a it's a it's obviously a multi billion dollar industry, but it's also it's one that's propped up by f f you know f fake propping up by the government that's protected them. I mean, you you what do you expect? What what, well, what is the public somebody expect in the chat room? Somebody in the chat room, and this ties in with some of the stuff in your book as well. They've said, and I'll just pull it up here because it's a good comment, really caught my eye, and it was from Bru uh, Bruce Bruce me not. It's a eugenics system with a soft kill policy. 
Um, they are killing us slowly. And I couldn't disagree with that. You really can. can't. On the face of I it, can't, you can't. I can't disagree with that either. No. I think I think that that's right. I understand that that sounds alarmist and, and a bit crazy on the surface. But there is a, a real the depopulation and eugenics uh, component to this world government is a very real thing. It, it's it, it sounds bad. It's it, you know, you'll get eye rolls when you bring it up to people that aren't in the black belt level conspiracy theory. But you but it, it is it is very real. And and there are people that have been working in the, those industries in, in the, the eugenics world for a hundred over 100 years that are very upfront about their intentions for things like that. They want a, they want a two tiered system of people. They want gods and clods, as they call it. You know, they want they want them at the top, and they want a bunch of brain dead moron serfs down at the bottom. And I, I would argue that they're well on their way to getting that. I mean, whether we do it intentionally to ourselves or whether they're dumbing us down with GMO foods and chemtrails and vaccines that are loaded with all kinds of poisons, or you know pushing smoking and, and suppressing natural health uh, and, 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 you know, raising up the pharmaceutical industry to be the only cure for anything. I mean, it's hard to argue that they aren't trying to kill us. It's bizarro land. It's upside mm -hmm. down world. Call it what you want. We're in the inversion, dude. Or as yeah. Ike would call it, a schism. There's a schism occurring. Well, I, you know, it, it's it's easy to be dismissive of these things when when they sound so bad, and when you you, you start to say, well, is the whole pharmaceutical industry involved in this? Oh, so all the doctors are in on this too? No, the doctors aren't. The doctors go to med school, and they're told how the system works. The med schools are heavily financed by the pharmaceutical industries. The doctors grow into this not knowing any difference. It's not their fault. Yeah. It's not that the doctors are are you know get it and 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 they're like oh well against you know I'm still going to inject these kids. The doctors are part of the problem, but not the problem that you might think. They're unintentional participants in this. They're also financially incentivized to keep in the United States, at least to keep a high vaccination rate. If you have a 64% vaccination rate in the United States, you get a bonus from the pharmaceutical industry. It works out for a private practice. It works out to close to, a, depending on if you have 400 uh, customers, clients, whatever, patients uh, in your in your practice, and you keep them at a 64% vaccination rate, you're due to get about a $100,000 bonus. So there's now a financial incentive to, to them as well. It's not to say that the doctors know it and do it for that, but they're aware of it. They, they certainly understand it. But in their minds, the vaccinations are helping all the kids. They, 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 they don't want to hear the other stuff. They probably haven't even read the insert. Hell, in, I posted a, a picture uh, from a vaccine insert from one of the manufacturers that lists one of the potential side effects as autism. They list it. And people are like, where'd you get that from? I got it from their own their own insert for the vaccine. So if they don't possibly cause autism, then why are they listing autism as one of the side effects? Why does that make me crazy to point that out? When if they say it's not in there, then they're there to be believed. But if I if I point out that it's in their own paperwork, I'm a conspiracy theorist. Well, whatever. Maybe I'm just somebody that knows how to read. You're not the one that right you're, you're not the one that met with somebody in private and discussed kind of uh, burying the results that some no. of these vaccines may see, result in no, autism see, wasn't you. sure as hell did. Absolutely. CDC did. And they have been busted for it. They came out not long ago, and they were talking about a yellow fever vaccine or vaccination that is potentially fatal. Now, uh, okay. So Well, that'll cure you from yellow uh, fever real quick. Exactly. Why in the earth's name would you take something that's potentially lethal to protect yourself against a potentially lethal virus? It just makes no sense. No sense at I all. And then a... every year we're told, oh, it's flu season. Come and get your flu shot. Right. You don't need to be a genius to know that viruses, they mutate. By definition, that's what a virus does. So unless you've got the winning numbers to the lottery in the top of your head and you can predict, like, random mutations in nature, there's absolutely no way that they're ever going to get that flu vaccination right for the upcoming season. Yet they tell all of us to roll up our sleeves, go and get it, or or we'll be the cause of mass genocide because we're going to be spreading these deadly germs everywhere, Charlie. The science doesn't even make sense, dude.
we're in the wrong business. We should be making calendars and sell them to viruses because apparently <laughs> viruses are very concerned with what time of year it is. They're gonna they come out only at certain times because it's flu season, it's like it's Christmas season. Great. But, okay. I think it's a litmus test to see how stupid people are yeah. that they'll believe all these things. And if you're dumb, and I think I, I honestly do think that that there's part of this, which is them sitting back saying. Anybody that has any sort of sense will figure this out and step aside and move out of the way. Anybody else that's too dumb to figure this out, they probably can't you help see, us with our agenda anyway. There's part of me wonders, you know, and it's along these lines, maybe we're looking at things wrong, you know. Like you say, it's almost as if they're saying, well, if people are this stupid, you know, hell mend them. This is like universal karma. All the information's yeah. out there, yet they still trust us. And at one point, I used to think maybe, you know, you hear about this, like, 500 million to hold the... The, the planet in the perfect optimum conditions. And I wonder, you know, I wondered back at the time, and I still wonder today, is it actually the truthers that they want to keep around? Do they want to sort out the wheat from the chaff here? Yeah. Because if I was sharing well, the planet with 500 people, 500 million people, I would want those 500 million people to be alert, switched on, awake and aware. Because that's the only yeah. way you're going to move forward, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, Henry Kissinger says that he wants to, he thinks that we should cut world population in half. And I think that we should start with cutting Henry Kissinger in half. <laughs> I mean, it always seems fair, right? Have you got a chainsaw? Because you'd probably need two. I mean, I could borrow one. I'll get a flamethrower from Elon Musk. Oh, it's okay. I'll probably have uh, the British police come in and visit me now just for thinking about such a thing, you know, the thought How crime. Dare you? I'm a thought You're criminal. Definitely. Yeah, I'm one of these toxic <laughs> masculine thought criminals, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a you're a binary thought criminal. Uh, how dare you assume? Fluid, how dare fluid, you? How criminal. dare you assume what I identify as today, my friend? That's just terrible. You should know that I identify as the microphone on a Monday, just because it's the first show of the week, Charlie. So you can call me Mister Microphone tonight. Yes, well, Mr. Microphone, I hear you have a big week planned with huge some week. pretty good guests. Yeah, a huge week. None as big as yourself, Charlie. All equal guests, my friend. Tomorrow, oh, we have got, it. coming on to the show, Jojo Seabacker. Of course, Jojo will be coming on. We'll be taking your phone calls. We'll be talking about the new age versus what Jojo gets into. And then on Wednesday, you know I'm looking forward to this, Charlie. Ryan Gable from The Secret Teachings will be back, hopefully, Fingers crossed, because I know Ryan's other half is expecting a little baby anytime soon. So I would actually be delighted if that show didn't happen, because that means there's a new arrival on the way. So all the best to Ryan and his other half. And then on Thursday, oh, dim the lights, Charlie boy. We're getting creepy. We're going all the way to Ireland, where for once my accent won't be the main accent on the show. And Enda Coyne is somebody that's going to be talking to us all about paranormal activity and how it's plagued him throughout his life so yeah it's gonna be another big week here but next week uh, monday a week today brendan drackler is going to be coming on from the rochester institute of technology to discuss astrophysics no less charlie yeah that'll be fun i love that stuff i don't understand it the way I thought I did until I, 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 I love it. I thought I did until I spoke to him, but no, I don't. <laughs> I don't either. I've got I've heard, lots. He's to been learn. on before. You've talked to him before. He's um, you know, it's quite easy for people in alternative media to call every scientist a shell and all the rest of it, but when you actually speak to people who are you know learning or going through their PhD right now, I was totally refreshed at the fact this guy was open to. All sorts of theories, you know, totally contrary to what he's studying himself, but open to it, Charlie. Yeah, and sometimes, yeah, it sometimes, sometimes we seem to think that you know, science is kind of closed shop, and they're told what to say, and that's it. They're told the party line. But when you actually speak to these people, they're very open-minded, and that encourages me. Really does. Well, he explained how you how they have these a lot of meetings where they sit together and argue with one another. Yep. I thought that was that was something I wasn't familiar with. Well, we are out of time, and Charlie will be back next month. I hope. I've got my fingers crossed here. So until next time, stay tuned for Lucky coming after.